Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Red Haired Stokey. So this week I told everybody that I would be talking about Molly Lee. There's a lot of misinformation about Molly Lee. And I think a lot of it stems from, because she died such a long time ago, and because superstitions and witchcraft and ghosts and all that sort of thing pique everyone's interest, whether you believe in it or not. You know, everybody thinks about it. Everybody likes to hear the stories, whether you believe in ghosts and witches and goblins or not. And this is one of them things. So for everybody that lives in Stoke-on-Trent, I'm not sure many people have not heard about Molly Lee. And what I'm going to do today is beat down some of that misinformation with actual factual research and tell you what the woman was really like as a person from genuine statements from her last will and testament and from a real stoky um, conversation in a pub from someone who actually went to her funeral, believe it or not. We do actually have a record of someone that was at her funeral. Now, the legend as it goes is she lived in a cottage she was slightly disfigured. She lived on her own. She was a bit weird, a bit of a witch. She sold milk. She had herbs and spices and things in a cottage. She lived in a thatched cottage. And then the legend starts there. Now that, in the 1600s, 1700s, was enough to make you branded a witch. But we're going to dig into it a little bit deeper. And what we'll do is we'll start with... We'll start at the beginning. Now, she was born in 1685, and it was a cottage which, at the time, would have been on the edge of the moorland, because Burslem, as we know it now, was a very, very different place. Um, I think the way that we think of Burslem now is more like a tiny little city town, and then you think back to the industrial time of Burslem, and that was, you know, the pot banks, Wedgwood, all them sort of things. But we're going before that, before all the big pot banks got there, before all the industry. And it was a little tiny village, a very, very small village on the edge of Moorland. And she was born in a cottage, a thatch cottage that had a couple of little farm buildings with it. And it's said that after a few hours that she could actually chew a piece of bread crust. Now, I can't find any record of this, but it's one of them things that's just been passed down. And it also says that she refused her mother's milk and fed from animals. Again, I can't find any genuine record of this. But it seems from the research and the things that we found that she did have some kind of facial disfigurement. Probably going by the date and the time that she was about, it was probably a smallpox scar. Smallpox was really prevalent back in those days. And if you survived it, it genuinely did scar you a lot. It didn't, you know, it, it left its telltale signs. So she was allegedly so ugly that she was shunned by the locals. And the only friend she made was a blackbird. She made a living selling milk. She had a small herd of cows, um, although she was accused a number of times of watering down her milk. Now, the local parson, who was Reverend Spencer, was not happy that she didn't attend church every Sunday. And so, obviously, 1600s, 1700s, he, he accused her of witchcraft. And he claimed that... She made her blackbird sit on the sign of the Turk's Head pub, which made the beer sour and gave the patrons rheumatism. Yeah. And then she also apparently put a spell on the Reverend. And when he tried to shoot her bird, which kept him drunk for three weeks. Realistically, it sounds like he tried to shoot a bird, missed, and then he got drunk for three weeks and blamed it on Molly Lee. 
what you make your mind up which story sounds more realistic then she died in 1748 and this is where the legend starts really so the story goes that the funeral was led by Reverend Spencer. Again, I know he obviously didn't like it, but this is a very small village and there's only so many people in it. And then afterwards, they all went for drinks in the Turk's Head. And it sounds like they went for drinks in the Turk's Head for any reason. And then when the party went back to the cottage, now there's no record of where, why they went back to the cottage, but if Molly's dead and she hadn't got any ancestors or anything like that, any, anyone to, any living relatives... Maybe they were going back to rob her. You never know. But it seems that she was sitting in her nook by the fire, knitting. This is after they buried her. <laughs> so then Spencer, along with some local clerics, went back to the graveyard, dug her back up at one o'clock in the morning, threw her live blackbird in the coffin, and then reburied her north to south, apparently to appease a ghost. That's the legend as it stands. And... It all sounds a little bit to me like a woman who was trying to be independent, was living on her own, and the locals didn't like her because she looked a bit different. But, you know, we'll see. The truth about her life is very, very different. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that now, because I think she deserves to have the truth told about her. So she was born in 1685, like I said. And she, her name was actually Margaret Lee. And she lived in the family home, which was Jackfield Farm. And it was made up of a thatched cottage and farm buildings. And it had been in the family quite some time by then. It was occupied by a Richard Lee in 1640. And the land had probably been in the family since at least the beginning of the century. Now, if you'd go onto my blog, which is the Red Aired Stokey, you can just search for it on Google. I have written an article about this. And if you go on to the article, there is actually a photograph. Well, it's apparently a photograph of her cottage before it was demolished. I can't find anything to say that it wasn't her cottage. I know that some local historians believe that photography wasn't far enough along, but I'm a professional photographer and I've done plenty of research into it. At the time that it was demolished, there could have been a photo of it. And in all of the archives, this photo is recorded as Molly Lee's. But on the blog, I've actually put a map showing you where it used to be in Burslem. So feel free to go and have a look at that afterwards. Now, it seems that the Richard Lee that was on the, the census and the records at the time was her father. And her mother was Sarah Lee. And after Richard's death, it seemed that she remarried a man called Joseph Booth, who became Molly's stepfather. And her mother then became Sarah Booth. She grew up with a mother and stepfather, although it seemed that she didn't get on with the stepfather at all. But because she was an only child, there, I mean, there's no record of her having any brothers or sisters. And when her parents died, the farm was actually left to her. So she inherited the farm and quite a substantial amount of land and other holdings that were nearby. So she was obviously quite an astute and independent businesswoman. Now, the farm generated income by selling hay, straw and dairy farming. And there's actually record of this. So like I mentioned earlier about her having a small herd of cows, if the farm was generating a decent income, she probably didn't just have two or three. And she probably had farmhands working for her, you know, to, to manage the herd to mow the land, to cut the, the wheat and the straw and things like that. So she then generated further income by leasing out other lands. And again, there is a record of this. There was a place called Wall Flat in Burslem. I, I can't find where it was, but it was definitely in Burslem. And the records say that she leased this out to a friend that she had called Alice Beach. Now, her face was deformed. This does seem to be true. There is a record, you know, mentioning her facial disfigurement. Although, like I say, there is quite a few, there's not really any explanations as to why, but smallpox does seem to be the main sort of thing that I can figure that would do it. And 
you imagine if you had smallpox today and your face was all scarred and you know you didn't look very nice imagine going you know go to school with them scars on your face imagine walking down the street people aren't very nice today can you imagine what it would have been like as an independent woman which people didn't like back in those days with a severe facial disfigurement her life must have been hell from the locals but it does seem that she wasn't a lonely woman because in her will she actually left her estate to a mother who outlived her it was when her father died that he left the farm her stepfather died and left the farm to her but her mother actually outlived her and she had got cousins her friends and her aunt and uncle all of these people are mentioned in her will and in fact by the time she died she was actually quite a very quite a wealthy woman and quite a well-known woman now just talking a little bit more about the farm jackfield farm in Molly's time, like I said before, it would have been a very, very different place. It would have been a really rural area, surrounded by woods, moorland, marshland, mine shafts, marl holes. Very, very different from the Burzum that we know today. And the cottage itself was a long, low building, which matches the photograph on, on my blog. But it was made half of timber and with a thatched roof. And the windows were very small and the roof was really low. So it was probably quite dark in the cottage. And the modern day area, like I say, you can go onto my blog and have a look at the map, which is the red-haired Stokey. It would have sat, if, if you know the area at all, at the junction of like Hamill Road and Park Road, where the terrace houses sit. There's a school there now. But there's absolutely no trace of it left. You can't see anything. And to be honest, if you go up and have a look at the area, you can't even imagine it because it's so different than it would have been. Now, after Molly died in 1748, the farm seems to have ended up in the hands of Joseph Booth. So just to reiterate, her father died and left the farm to her. Her mother outlived Molly, but she married Joseph Booth. So that's a stepfather. And then when Molly died, the farm seems to have ended up in his hands. It's all a little bit confusing. But she didn't actually request this in a will. She was not happy about that. She wouldn't have been happy about it. Um, and there's no evidence to say how he ended up with Jackfield Farm. But as far as I can tell, back in the 1700s, men had all the power. So Molly would have probably left the farm to family members and he would have you know gone in and out of the law and probably ended up with it because that's what they did but by 1670 so she died in 1748 and by 1670 the estate was held by the bennett family and by the late 1830s when it was still standing john bennett was the owner as well as the occupier and we don't know when the farm was built but we know that early 1600s, it was a farm. But we do know that it was demolished in 1894. Um, and after being in the family for so many years, she was actually the last of that family line because she was unmarried, she was child free. And when her mum and stepdad died, the farm would have been sold. And that's how it ended up in a different family. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about her death. So she died in 1748, seemingly of natural causes, but before she died, she actually managed to write and sign her will on March the 25th, 1748. She was buried on the 1st of April and her funeral was led by the Reverend Spencer who it seems, like I mentioned earlier, was quite the drinker, which probably saw, started a lot of the problems. Now, as I mentioned before, there is actually a record of a person who went to Molly Lee's funeral, and he could remember what happened there. He, he was a relative of Molly, and his name was Ralph Lee. He was 82 at the time of the conversation, and the conversation was had with a man called John Talwright, who was 70 at the time. 
Now, in 1810, a man called John Ward wrote a record verbatim of the two men talking in Basel Marketplace. They then moved to the Turk's Head, bought around a gin and talked about many, many things, one of which was Molly's funeral. Now, on my blog, you can go and read it word for word. If you're not from Stoke, I really wouldn't bother because it is the broadest Stoke accent and it's difficult to read even for someone like me who is Stokey through and through. And the conversation is on my blog, word for word, um, and it was from John Ward's book, The Borough of Stoke on Trent, which was written in 1810. I'm going to give you like a rough a rough go through of it for, for you guys that are listening. But again, please go and read it on the blog because it's really good. So we've got Tal Wright who's saying, do you remember your cousin Peggy who lived at Jack Fox Farm? And they buried a crossways in the churchyard. Um, I remember when I was younger, scampered at a pretty rate past the church, frightened of seeing a, burger, a, a, a ghost, basically. And Lee replies, Methink there has been sure and something as a ghost were fast enough, lad. I think it says. I like it. <laughs> I'm not very good with it. Please go and read it. Um, but what it basically says is when they buried her and they laid her quiet enough in the grave and she was east to west, but when they got back to the Hamel, there were a scatter scattering among the bearers because when they went into the house, they'd seen her sitting in the nuke, knitting it at a fair rate. Um, he says, I didn't see it myself, but Parson Spencer was first, what a shock. And he basically said that they need to lay her body the other way to give her, to put her to rest. Um, so he went and got the clock and the Saxon and with a lantern and a candle, they dug up the coffin, dug the grave crossways and laid her in. Um, and apparently that was enough to lay a ghost to rest. I'm not going to keep trying to... Um, read that because it a lot of it actually doesn't make any sense but <laughs> if you if you're good at reading broad stoke you please go ahead but he so from what i can gather parson spencer was the first person in the cottage and apparently he saw it in the car in the corner knitting away in a rocking chair um it says here though that the old parson rather liked to drink he was fond of a drop of drink and was sure of himself. And the bearers were fuddled because they hadn't seen it, but they were sober. So who knows? But this is why she's buried the wrong way. And this, this is actually a record. And this is a guy who was genuinely at her funeral. And it says, um, your Aunt Molly would be buried crossways. Well, your cousin, blah, blah, blah. And then it says, and then a tombstone was built as it stands, crossways. And he says, yeah, to be sure it were a queer concern. I suppose it were an April Fool's job. And then he put, yeah, sure, it was April the 1st, just two years after the Scotch rebels coming as far as Bagnall. That's a different story. But that's interesting. Now, we know that her funeral was on April the 1st. Was this an April Fool's joke? Was this Parson Spencer's way of getting back at Molly after she died? After I feel like she's probably really annoyed him during her lifetime because she was wealthy, she was well known, she was ugly in a you know, like I said, about a face being deformed. But she had enough money and enough power that I'm assuming he didn't have any power over her. And I bet he didn't like that. As a as a man in the 1700s. I can't imagine that he liked that. I can't imagine that he would have taken to that kindly. But there was nothing he could do about it. She just lived a life. She got on with it. She amassed more wealth. She must have been quite the employer in the area. Because bearing in mind she got a farm. She got a couple of other bits of land. A couple of other buildings that people would have had to maintain. You know, she would have had builders, farm labourers, farm hands people taking things to market. She wouldn't have been able to do all of this herself. And she didn't have any family, really, um, that would have helped. 
there wasn't really any men. She didn't have any kids. She didn't have any brothers or sisters. And it, that's the only thing I can think, really. But there are a few things to take away from this conversation. The first thing is that they actually called her Peggy, which is short for Margaret. And this gives quite a feeling of familiarity. Now, it is, like I say, did Reverend Spencer, was he just drunk? Was he just a drunkard? Or did he scare people with, you know, the story of a ghost, just a spider? And another thing is, it seems that quite a lot of people at the funeral were drunk. They went on to the Turk's Head after the funeral and then back to Molly's cottage. And like I say, I, I'm not convinced. I think Reverend Spencer did it to wind people up. And I think in a small little village like that back in them days, anything would have scared them. They were dead superstitious. But the story of the Reverend and the local Clark and Saxon digging her up and turning her around is actually very unlikely because it would have been illegal for them to do it without the relevant documents and a court case at the, the Court of Chancery. And it seems that people were just really superstitious. But he was drunk and he hated her. So did he? Probably. He probably did, didn't he? Let's be honest. Now, the tombstone, and if anybody have actually been to Molly Lee's grave in Burslem, you see the big, huge tombstone. That would have been erected quite a reasonable amount of time after a death, because in those days, the stone would have been hand-cut um, and shaped by stonemasons and then had to be transported to the site. But it wasn't a quick thing. And... This would have all taken time and it would have been very expensive. And one of the things that we've always said about Molly Lee's grave is if she was just a witch and nobody liked her, why did she have such a big, elaborate stone tombstone? Because it wouldn't have been cheap. But because she was a landowning woman and because she had this wealth, that does explain that. And the reason for a grave facing the other way, it's probably nothing to do with witchcraft at all. If Reverend Spencer had genuinely accused her of being a witch and he genuinely thought she was a witch, she couldn't have been buried in consecrated ground. She couldn't have been buried in the churchyard. Um, and I think the reality of it is people were just buried where it was convenient. It's not unusual for old graves to face different ways. And there's lots of examples of this across the country. If you go into most, I'm talking like old village churchyards, what you'll find is that a lot of the graves face different ways. It's only probably starting in the Victorian times and when they started opening up like local crematoriums and specific graveyards without churches that they started laying everybody uniform and that was only because it could fit them in. But moving on to her will, um, there wasn't really a record of much of this and I don't think many people had, had actually done the research but her will has existed this whole time and it's actually been privately owned for the last 200 years someone had actually got this in their home and I, I don't know if they knew what they got but eventually it was returned to Stoke-on-Trent um, and you can you can find a typed up copy of it with all of her assets and all the things that she bequeathed to people. Now I'll give you a rundown of what was in the will, because I think it's really, really interesting. So it's dated March the 25th, which on the 21st year of the reign of King George II, which is just a few days before her death. Um, and she, like I say, she was buried on the 1st of April in 1748. Now, she really was a rather wealthy woman by the time she died. She owned various estates. And she was a benefactor of, to the church and to the poor of Sneed and Burslem. So this is a woman who actually actively gave to charity. She gave money to the poor. She gave money to the church. And this is my favourite thing. And this is, I love this. And this, to me, says what she was like as a person versus Parson Spencer. She left profits from her lands and 46 penny loaves of bread yearly to be distributed amongst such of the poor inhabitants and the widows 
for the time living within the hamlet of Sneed and Burslem. Now, that to me just shows what kind of a woman she was. So the poor inhabitants and the widows every year would receive 46 penny loaves of bread. You know, that that was a huge thing to poor people. There was no benefits. There was no, you know, you had to go to the church and beg, you know, for a few pence. But she's actively giving money, food, every year after she's died, she's still giving it. And even though Parson Spencer was a bit of a tool to her, she left money for the repair of monuments that were in the churchyard. And any leftover money from the monuments was to also be distributed to the poor. Now, her mum, Sarah Booth, inherited all of the land and the farm at Jackfield and all of the income that it generated. She expressly ordered in a will that a stepfather, who is mistakenly called a father-in-law in the will, was to have nothing to do with it. But again, like I said, there's no, we, there's no record of why he ended up with it, but he did. Her aunt, Mrs. Margaret Booker, was left a sum of £10, which is just over £2,500 now, every year for the remainder of her life. So that's like two and a half grand every year for the rest of her life. It gives you an idea of the sum of money this woman had. Um, her friend, Ali Speech, she left the parcel of land called Wall Frat, Flat that she was already leasing from Molly. So Molly not only let her lease it, she actually gave it to her when she died. After the death of her mother and aunt, she gives £20 a year, which is about £4,500, to her cousin Anne Donbavan for life to help her be sufficient without her husband. <laughs> which, again, says a lot to me about the type of person she was because she left money to the widows. She's left money to a cousin to help her be sufficient without a husband. And I feel like this is because she's had nothing but crap off men a whole life. And I think she doesn't want the women around her to have the same issues that she had. So she left the farm to her mum. She left this money to Anne. She left the land to Alice, you know. And then she lists dwelling house with its adjacent buildings and lands. And lands in Jackfield, Norton, Warflat and Newbold Asprey in Chester. How she came to own land in Chester, I don't know. I can't find anything about it. And if anybody does know, please let me know. Because for this woman who has been accused of being a witch for the last 200 odd years, has land across the country. <laughs> she doesn't just own a few fields in a little village. She owns, you know, I don't know if it's a dwelling house or something, but in Chester, it's crazy. And after the death of the people listed in her will, she leaves £400, which is nearly £90,000 today, to be distributed between the children of her cousin, Anne Dombavan. I mean, this is a lot of money. This is adding up to be a lot of money. Um, she leaves the lands in Chester to her other cousin, Luke Bennett, and then on to his heirs. And then everything else was to be sold for the best price it can. And the money was to be used to build a hospital in Burslem for poor women and their ongoing maintenance and clothing of them. However, there is absolutely no evidence that this was ever built. Where the money went, I don't think we'll ever know. And then she also left, um, I think it was a silver plate and some, you know, utensils to her mother and a gold mourning ring to just a few other people in the family got a few little bits and bobs. And the 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 people who wrote the will up were her cousin Luke Bennett and Mr. Joseph Lovett. Now, Joseph was a man of quite high standing in Stoke-on-Trent. He was born in Greenhead House in Penkel, which is actually now the, grey, the Greyhound Inn. And he was a well-educated man. And later in his life, he actually became the estate manager of Church Castle in Wales. So the people that she associated with weren't small town people. And their association with this man alone shows that she was a much, of a much higher social standing than anybody previously thought. 
add that, add to that the properties and lands that she owned. And it shows that she was actually a very independent, wealthy and business minded woman. But it also shows us that she was a champ, you know, not just a champion of the poor and the downtrodden, um, but also that she was something of a, of a feminist. So she gave her lands and money to women in her family to ensure that they were financially independent of the men, knowing that men had all the power. And she also gave the money, like I say, to the poor women as a community and funds for a hospital for women. And I think she never married, so she was financially independent of men. And the laws in them days would have said that if she did marry, she'd have lost everything. She would have lost everything to the man that she married. Maybe that's why she didn't marry. And I think what we need to take away from this is how easily your perception of someone can change when you're not presented with all the facts. Many, Most people in Stoke-on-Trent know Molly Lee as Molly Lee, Molly Lee, you know, chasing me around the apple tree or whatever it is. And I know that stories like that endure. And to be honest, it, it's, it's a good job it did because we wouldn't be here talking about her today without these stories and superstitions of her being the Basel Witch. But I'm glad that we finally know the truth about her. I'm glad that we finally realised that actually she was awesome. I mean, we're not, we're not talking 50, 60 years ago. We're talking 200 years ago in the mid-1700s. When women, you know, you couldn't go out and get a job. You couldn't be financially independent. You were born, you worked in the field, you became a servant. You married, you became from, you went from your father's house to your husband's house. And then you had kids and they did the same. That was just the way of life. But Molly didn't. And I think I would like to know more about a dad because I feel like he probably was a good influence on her. And the fact that he left the farm to her, he must have realised that she could run it. And I would also love to know if she amassed all of this wealth and lands and property herself because it doesn't seem that any of it was passed down to her. So all of the bits of land that she owned, all of the houses, all of the estates that she owned were hers she bought them or she invested or you know we don't know how she got them but she did and the people that she, that she associated with were powerful men and men in those days I mean you pretty much had to stick within your social status you couldn't you couldn't be a farmer and that like head down to London and go into high society it didn't work that way and this is why I think that Parson Spencer didn't like her, because I think she was much higher up the, the ladder than he would ever go. I think she had more money than he would ever have. And I think she had more power than he would ever have. And I don't think he liked it. He was a drunkard. And she was she must have been religious. I think everybody was religious in those days, but she didn't go to church every Sunday and that made an issue for him. And I think, unfortunately, these rumours and stories they passed down the years I mean look at the witch trials we know the witch trials because of the accusations of the women that were witches we know what they were accused of but we don't until people many many years later did the research we didn't actually know anything about the women that were accused but now we know that they you know some of them were independent women some of them were you know financially stable on their own and again they were threatened by it but I think it's important to share this I think it's important you know let people know I have written a, a blog article on it so if anybody wants to go on read that you can just go onto the Red Ed Stokey website and just search for Molly Lee I will be putting this on as a podcast as well so if you've got anybody that you know that would like to listen to this please share it with them but yeah, I just feel like it's a shame that women, independent women through time, have always been shamed in some way 
for being those strong, independent women. And there are stories of women through the years who have got over this and we know them as strong, independent women. But for the case of Molly Lee, it didn't work that way. He was believed, he called her a witch 200 years ago and 200 years down the line, we still call her Molly Lee the witch when there's absolutely no evidence of it. In fact, there's far more evidence saying that she was a feminist, she was fiercely independent. And I think that's the Molly Lee we should remember. But like I say, this is why this story's endured is purely because folk tales, witches, wizards, they're a more interesting story than, well, to most people, than a woman who can pay her own bills. But to me, and to you guys watching and listening, for someone who, I don't know, I just find her amazing. To be in a small village and have a facial disfigurement and to still be that much of a businesswoman and that independent and to be, you know, mixing with the higher classes, I think is a real show of strength. And I think that, to me, is how Molly Lee should be remembered. So next time anybody asks you, if, if you know anything about Molly Lee, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. And if you go online, you can search for her last will and testament and you can read it yourself. And I think reading through it, you get a feel for, you know, who she was, what she did. And I think I, I would love to know what happened about the hospital that was supposed to be built in Burslem. That really annoys me. Because where did the money go for that? And when did the money run out? Because how many years did the poor get bread? You know, how many years did the church use her money for the poor? And I'd love to know more about a tombstone, but there's just no records. Not that I can find anyway. Um, but yeah, so I think I'll leave it there. I'll leave you all to think on it. If anybody's you know, got any questions or any information or if there's anything at all that anybody would like to add to this, please do contact me. I would love to hear from you. Um, you can contact me at theredheadstokey.co.uk. All my information and details are on there. Um, you can also sign up to the newsletter on my website so you can get any articles that I write. You can sign up on YouTube. And I do this show every week on a Thursday about some Staffordshire history topic or another. So thank you very much for joining me. But yeah, I'm going to leave it there. And that's the truth about Molly Lee, the Burslem witch. So yeah, thank you very much for joining me.